Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. Um, uh, we're coming to you from Amiskwachi, Wesquehagan, sometimes known as Edmonton, Alberta. And we are in Treaty 6 territory, which is the traditional homeland um, of the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Inuit, and many other Indigenous people. Um, sound and music uh, have been heard, created, and celebrated here for thousands of years by many diverse First Nations and cultures, and tonight we want to humbly add our sounds to this history with respect and solidarity. Now, this evening, I, however, am not personally in Amiskwachi, Wesquehagan. Um, I'm actually in um, Imnitsaka Uthnugwe, or St. Paul, Minnesota, um, near Wakpatanka, which is the Mississippi River in the territory of uh, the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux, uh, de Sioux, which is the traditional homeland of uh, the Dakota and Anishinaabe people. Um, so if you're here for the first time, uh, and we welcome you. Uh, Sound Studies Institute, or SSI, is in a research institute at the University of Alberta uh, that celebrates and supports research into sound from all angles, including performative and artistic understandings of sound, i.e. music, uh, and also um, other human and non-human understandings of the role of sound in our world. And uh, we're really happy to be uh, coming to you with a guest this evening, um, D. Andrew Stewart, uh, who is a composer and a virtu virtuosic performer of many new electronic musical instruments, including the T-Stick and the Carlax. And I actually, I hope Andrew doesn't mind, <laughs> but I actually like to refer to him as the Clara Rockmore of the Carlax. Um, and for those of you who are students of the history of electroacoustic music, um, you might know what I mean by that in the sense that Clara Rockmore was a virtuosic performer on the violin who was conservatory trained um, and gave up that traditional instrument to devote her life to the artistry of a brand new electronic musical instrument, the theremin. And uh, I, I like to think of Andrew as that kind of person. Um, I've had the pleasure of seeing him perform many times uh, both pieces of his own uh, and pieces by other composer who he commissions. And he is a dedicated and virtuosic and expressive uh, performer on a number of musical instruments, including some that he's been involved in as an inventor himself, um, or at least with, with a number of inventors. Um, and, uh, and so we're really happy to have him here. Uh, Andrew Stewart uh, explores the concept of, digital, of a digital sound performer a performer of sounds uh, on a category of digital music instruments called gestural controllers. Um, so Stuart uh, suggests that the sound performer's essential duty is to live sound better. That is to say, the sound performer promotes respect for sound and all of its features as a consequence, uh, and as a consequence promotes respect for the recipients of sound all hearing creatures on the earth. Similar to society's keepers of the peace, sound performers are the keepers and conveyors of, a health, of healthy listening practices, creating an oral fascination in the world's soundscapes in which we all share. In addition, DeAndrew Stewart illustrates how digital um, luthery, um, that is instrument design, offers unique opportunities to enhance the sound performer's practice with sensor technology that captures and sonifies uh, gives sonic form to uh, movements, gestures, and postures. In this way, uh, the use of digital musical instruments makes uh, the oral experience for the audience more palpable and visible, making the living sound better. Uh, DeAndre Stewart is a composer, pianist, and digital musical instrumentalist. A convergence of acoustic and electroacoustic instrumental praxis is at the center of his work. Uh, his music is dedicated to exploring composition, and performance for new interfaces for musical expression by adapting and evolving traditional praxis. Stewart's work asks whether musical, the musical idea, uh, concept theory, material, technique, and means has kept pace with the, digital, uh, with the developments um, in digital luthery. Uh, furthermore, uh, what are the essential constituents for creating a viable digital instrument in the 21st, for the 21st century composer? 
Uh, Stuart has contributed to the field of music technology through his demonstrations at the International Conference on New Musical, uh, New Interfaces for Musical Expression, which is, I believe, where I met Andrew the first time, uh, and many, many other conferences and festivals. I won't read them all tonight because I want to actually jump right in and turn it over to Andrew uh, this evening. So welcome, Andrew, and uh, uh, we will turn it over to you. Wow. Thank you for that, Scott. That was lovely. Lovely to have that read out. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, I don't know if you caught, I was trying to support you, right? So I had Clara there for a minute. So there was Clara Rockmore uh, playing the theremin. Um, but you know what? Um, people have compared me to this guy, actually, uh, Brishnikov. Um, I once had, um, uh, who was that? Um, oh, darn, it'll come to me. Uh, Quebecois composer referred to me as a combination of Brish Brishnikov and John Cage. Um, so... Yeah, strange. So I'm I'm, su I'm supporting your uh, your your <laughs> your intro. Thanks very much, Scott. That's that's very nice. Um, why don't I just? Uh, I guess I'm I'm uh, I got the green light to share, right? To share some screens and stuff. So why don't I at least get that screen up? Because of course uh, I have a bit of a formal um, presentation. Is that is that working out? You see that fine? Yeah. Um, that's okay. great. Awesome. Yeah, so thanks, thanks again, Scott. Um, thanks, Tom, for um, the work you've been doing to help me uh, get coordinated and organized. Um, thanks, Gail, too. I'm just uh, happy to hear about your involvement. And maybe I'd love to hear more about what's happening in Sound Studies Institute. I think this is a fantastic initiative at U of A, so I am jealous. Uh, I'm coming, coming to you from the south. In Lethbridge, um, and from my uh, screen there, you can you can uh, you'll note that I'm at the University of Lethbridge. I'm teaching in the music department. Um, I'm primarily instructing in an undergraduate program called the Digital Audio Arts. So that's that's a major within the music department. So we have students that are of course coming to us for a bachelor of music, but they can specialize in some music technology. And I'm also a member of what's called Asterix. So that's Art, Sound, and Technology Research Intersections. So um, I'm hoping, I would love to speak to you, Scott, Gail, um, other Sound Studies members to see if there's some natural collaboration that might, might, might go on between our, our centers. So Asterix is a center, um, um, not specifically around sound, but bringing together all of our, um, our, our fine arts disciplines at the University of Lethbridge. And um, there we go. And just doing a little bit of window magic here. Yeah. So again, uh, thanks uh, everyone. Thanks for the organization of this. Um, I'm again coming from the U of L, uh, which is uh, located on the ancestral and traditional indigenous territories of the Blackfoot and the people of the Treaty Seven region in southern Alberta. That includes the Siksika, the Bigani, the Kenai, the Tutsina, and Stony, Nak Stony Nakoda First Nations. And this area is also the home for the third uh, region. Um, of the Métis Nation of Alberta. I'm actually, uh, I still feel quite new to this part of Canada. Um, I'm not from Alberta. And I will tell you uh, that I'm, I am um, a lover of, of uh, camping. I'm a lover of the outdoors. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm always amazed and charmed by, by the landscapes out here. And it reminds me um, of how much uh, respect I have for the land and, and for um, only imagining the um, indigenous cultures of our, our, our country living through this, it's it's a uh, great respect for what what they've done. Their their vision of of nature, especially and how they their worldview through the world through the, through um, their understanding and interaction with the, the nature, and that's one of the things I really enjoy about being here as well. I'm going to come back to this theme a little bit later. Okay. Um, maybe I should say too that I really wish I could be there with you in person. Um, I've got a little photo here of a talk we did pre-COVID, and that's me speaking to um, a group of people in one of our in our new science building at the U of L. But uh, boy, I wish I could I could be there with you. Um, I'd love to be able to um, play some of my instruments with you uh, for you live. That would be really nice. So I'm going to switch gears though to something a little bit maybe more wild here. And um, I'm gonna ask you to listen to some music. Um, I asked for a peppermint and 
I asked for her to, to get one. I'd love to see your faces and see if anybody has a question about what they heard. I don't know if people can throw things in the chat, but um, does anyone know what was what was going on there? Is any the, anything that sounded interesting? Backwards, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, we got some reversed sound going there. So, um, listen, I was I was recently reading an article uh, called "Forensic Listening." This is from um, uh, the collection of actually rich collection of issues around sound. Uh, from uh, the book that's called uh, Audio Culture, uh, Re Readings in Modern Music. But the, the article on forensic listening was by Lawrence Abu Hamdan uh, from 2011. And uh, so uh, just in a small section of um, Hamdan's um, article, he speaks about this, uh, the music of Judas priests and the, um, the, the possibility of there being hidden or maybe subliminal uh, messages in their music from their album, uh, Stained Glass, uh, in 1978. Um, Handman was talking about this uh, in relation to a 1985 uh, civil trial of a double suicide, actually, in the States, in, in Sparks, Nevada. And apparently the lawyers argued that the lyrics in Stained Glass contained hidden messages that urged uh, two young men um, to take their own lives uh, with a gun. And so the idea that um, the reverse lyrics somehow embodied, you know, the violence, uh, the violent act of suicide. Um, so reversing the music, the lawyers argued that uh, there were um, several instances of uh, the words, quote, do it, unquote, in um, stained glass. So the lead singer, uh, Rob Halford, um, his, first of all, his lyrics were like, like wholly scrutinized uh, for these sorts of messages and Halford himself um, thinking he could in fact practice his own style of forensic audiology uh, found phrases like I asked for a peppermint and I asked for her to get one when they reversed the lyrics of Exciter so that's what I just played for you a little bit of Exciter I, maybe you heard peppermint in there I'm not sure um, but, you know, as a composer, reading this article from Handman, Handman um, you know, I, I, it's, it's, of course, it's, it's a horrible um, context, right? Uh, of course, around suicide and the, the you know, it was quite um, alarming, of course, the, fundamentally about what, the, what, the, what he was writing about. And so I was experiencing, though, as a composer, I was experiencing, you know, some senses of guilt. And at the same time, kind of a sense of pride. <laughs> and I'll see if I can explain that, I was thinking like, I was wondering if I was there, I asked to Rob, ask the lead singer Halford if, if he felt any sort of musical accomplishment, you know, uh, by, by the attention his reversed lyrics were, were getting. Um, so, uh, you know, of course in my own music, I'm, I'm not of course trying to lead anyone to pain or suffering or death, but uh, I do I do want to acknowledge that there's unusual powers, uh, or maybe magical powers that are sometimes attributed to sound, and um, and then of course attributed to the sound makers. So that's this is a little bit of my setup for what I want to talk about this evening: the, the notion of the power of sound, and then um, the um, corollary to that: the power that the sound makers uh, have. Okay. So uh, Scott covered a lot of the, the basics of um, kind of my background. I did want to mention too that I'm, um, my, my training is actually wholly in classical music. So I had a classical music upbringing. So that, that influences actually a lot uh, about what I do. Uh, so I'm, you know, looking to create musical experiences that are long form kind of concert music pieces. Uh, I'm interested in music and sounds that invite people into the experience, you know, as opposed to say music that, you know, perhaps 
conveys or tries to convey specific feelings and you know telling people what to think. And so my my message, my music is is clearly quite abstract. And again, interested in inviting people into the sounds that I create. Um, I also come from the tradition of kind of large uh, collaborative ensemble playing as well. So a big part of what I do is uh, I try to uh, show how the instruments I play can be um, integrated with other perhaps more recognizable musical instruments. And um, I love ensemble play, uh, play with, with musicians, again, who are playing regular instruments. And of course, in people that are playing other experimental instruments, that's really where I, where I feel very much a home, a home in. So um, yeah, I'm here then to talk to, like on a very basic level, I'm here to talk to you about creating sound compositions, creating improvisations with digital musical instruments. And then this, this second layer, this idea of um, uh, the empowering feeling that comes from having uh, at, the, at your fingertips a control over the wide open sound world um, that uh, technology permits. And there's this kind of sense of responsibility that comes with that. Just while I um, while you read through my outline, uh, and again, feel free to throw things into the chat. I just I, I understand that the audience is quite diverse. That some of you uh, that you'll have probably diverse areas of interest and backgrounds. I don't know um, how many of you are playing musical instruments, or if you come from perhaps a more um, technological uh, foundation. Um, I'm happy to take uh, questions during the talk if anyone um, has anything they want to ask, especially if I lose you with jargon, right? If I'm, if I'm expressing myself in ways that maybe don't necessarily relate to, to your field. So again, I, I, invite, I invite people to, to ask questions certainly and uh, have little discussions between points. That's absolutely fine with me. And again, lastly, I wish I could be there for you. I'd love to, um, to have been able to, to play a little bit of music with you and for you. So uh, I wanted to try to set the stage with the next few slides for the, um, the role of sound, generally speaking, the role of sound in uh, the Western music tradition that, um, that I come, come from. And I thought I'd mention um, R. Murray Schaefer. R. Murray Schaefer was one of our um, senior composers in Canada. He just passed away um, uh, last August. And uh, for those of you who um, aren't familiar with Schaefer, he was, of course, a composer. He was an author. Uh, he did a lot of uh, site-specific uh, music dramas, um, type, I would say, verging on operatic in alternative uh, spaces, often in nature. Uh, he was an innovative music teacher, especially for young artists. And of course, he was a sound ecologist. He was at the, the origins of the World Soundscape Project back in the 60s and into the 70s. Um, my connection with, with Murray uh, goes back to the, uh, another project called And Wolf Shall Inherit the Moon, or, or just um, colloquially known as the Wolf Project. This was one of these site-specific music dramas that happened in the Halliburton forest uh, just next to Algonquin Park in Ontario. And again, um, through uh, my experiences in this project, I, I quickly realized how important uh, nature uh, is to me and, and the being able to commune or communicate or rely on nature to guide me through, through the world. And so, um, of course, with that comes sound and the sounds that um, we collaborative, collaboratively produced in the Wolf Project will, will stay with me forever. Um, these are just a few little uh, graphics in my slide. Um, uh, there's an aria that the wolf uh, has to sing. I, I had to sing that a few times actually, and some other um, sketches of, of a boat landing that we all got very familiar with uh, through that project. So um, another, another project I wanted to talk about with Murray was his um, very short book. I have it here on my desk, uh, The Book of Noise. Um, very, very uh, uh, short reading. Excellent information though. Um, by reading this book, um, I realized that we all have a responsibility in um, controlling or rather in adding and contributing and um, respecting our, our sonic environment that we have to be aware, that we should be aware, 
of the sounds and the noises we make in our lives. I'm hoping, or I, I'm hoping that some of you have considered this perspective as well. Uh, so the book of noises, you know, it's it's a primer for concerned citizens. Um, it's about explaining the dangers of noise pollution in simple language and to suggest some solutions. Um, a quote, uh, quote, above all, remember that you are yourself a performer in the World Symphony. There will be there will be a time for you to be heard and a time to remain quiet and listen to others, end quote. Uh, Murray has some nice points too from the, um, the League of Hear the League uh, the League for the Heart of Hearing, based in New York. And so some suggestions from uh, Marie to you, to all of us, um, uh, care of the League of uh, League for the Heart of Hearing. Pay attention to the noises you make and respect your neighbor's right to peace and quiet. Turn down the volume one notch on your television. Turn off the television during dinner and have a quiet conversation instead. Ask your health club instructor to lower the music. Avoid noisy sports events, restaurants, rock concerts, and nightclubs unless you, unless you use hearing protection. Do not honk your horn except in the case of imminent danger and do not tip cab drivers who honk their horns illegally. Uh, again, a book about awareness really and pointing to responsibilities that we have as sound makers. Here's another responsible sound maker. So uh, some of you, I, 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 maybe some of you know Laurie, Laurie Radford, another Canadian composer um, based in Calgary. And um, this little, I have a little snippet of him talking about sound. So turning the focus perhaps now to the concern of the uh, music composer. I played the piano to begin with. I played the guitar very seriously for a long time. I played trombone. I played double bass. I uh, studied uh, voice, but at this point, to uh, a favorite orchestra, I mean a favorite instrument, is not obvious. Uh, I could almost say at this point it's the computer. <laughs> Just playing around with sound, exploring uh, uh, sound, thinking about sound. In terms of sound, movement of sound, structure of sound, of using sound, or environmental sounds, uh, manipulation of sound. Sound, the contact with sound, new tools for making sound, discovering sound. Right, okay, so there you go. Um, I, I have a lot of um, um, similar thoughts when it comes to sound, so uh, what Laurie speaks about it hits home also. Uh, with respect to sound, so that sound as say the 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 maybe the paint, uh, the paint for the composer, very important to think deeply about sound when you're um, a music composer. Uh, there are a lot of steps um, in the development of sound in in Western music. Um, that's not really going to be the topic of this presentation, but you know to name a few, I you know I go right back to say the futurism and their creation of um, mechanical, uh, mechanically produced noise, uh, that was their intonaru mori, um, to, you know, uh, the advent of, or rather the more um, stronger spotlight on the use of percussion in music, maybe from the um, American French composer Edgar Varese. Uh, of course, I think of John Cage and um, his, maybe his questioning of the absence of sound to uh, the traditions of electronic music, music concrete, acousmatic music, soundscape. Of course, um, I also think of all the developments in recording technology, especially in, um, in popular music. And I always like to, from time to time, look at what Wikipedia throws up for all of the um, genres of, of electronic music. Um, many that I don't know and don't fully understand, but I am uh, fully engaged by the fact that there's so many different uh, thoughts about um, sound in, in popular music. And, and there, we're, the, the, the field that I associate with is in the bottom left-hand corner there. So electroacoustic music, acousmatic, etc. I position myself primarily in the area of live electronics. So again, I'm, I'm controlling um, producing modulating sounds all uh, in real time on stage. So uh, before I leave this sound in Western music, again, just to remind us of what I wanna get to here that, 
you know, composers and performers uh, of sound, we have our, we do have a, a pretty um, important responsibility when controlling sound, even loudness, um, how we're going to impact people with the, the intensities that we produce from stage. These are all things that um, we gain expertise in and treat very, very carefully um, to get through, to, create, to um, communicate uh, our artistic ideas. So uh, that's, that comes with responsibility when you um, have to deal with that sort of way of thinking. So getting into the digital musical instrument realm. Um, so uh, for those of you who are instrumentalists, um, this first point will probably be um, familiar to you. So when, when we learn a musical instrument, it's usually all about uh, uh, pitch production and, and tuning and tone quality, controlling how loud you play, you know, learning to articulate, learning to control the color of your sound. And so these are all very um, classical ways of learning to play an instrument. Uh, what is sometimes, I think, forgotten in instrumental music is the actual physical gesture. Um, certainly there are um, instrumentalists, singers in particular, who think a lot about gesture on stage. Um, but um, I wanted to highlight gesture because as um, a performer on digital musical instruments, or as Scott mentioned, gestural, gestural controllers, the gesture is a very significant component. Um, I would say it's um, as equal as the sound production. Uh, there's, for instance, there's been studies done looking at, for instance, um, acoustic guitar performance and um, gauging uh, how audience members read the expressive intentions of a guitarist. And studies have shown that, for instance, for, uh, audience members will respond, for instance, to their the, the hand positions that the guitarist will use. So they're reading movements, for example, um, along the fretboard, the left hand, and equating that apparently with uh, the musician's expressive attentions, intentions. So, um, you know, gesture is, is active um, in music making and extremely active when it comes to um, gestural controllers. This is uh, a T-stick um, and I'm uh, <laughs> just showing a short video here that um, I was all about gesture, um, strange little hand movements, that sort of stuff. Um, I do wanna get into uh, digital musical instruments or give you a kind of survey of some instruments that are out there before I go to the Carvalax, which is what I'm gonna focus on toward the end. Um, again, I wish I was there in person. Is, 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 is the idea of um, a digital musical instrument, is that, is that new for anyone? Um, or maybe you can put like a, a check mark. Yes, if you're not eating your spaghetti, it's dinner time, right? Um, is, is this a new concept, digital musical instruments? Or are some of you working in this field, gestural controllers? I'm going to show you a few while you think about that. So the Axio, my goodness, I got a whole selection here, um, many variety of things, instruments that look like regular instruments, instruments, instruments that absolutely, absolutely do not look like regular instruments, the bass sleeve, um, a whole slew of instruments that are about tablet or tablet like surfaces, right? Um, that's the Bukla, thunder, um, flutes, body suits, biomuse, um, augmenting kalimbas. I hope you can see that. Uh, these are obviously very small Im images just to get them all on the screen. How about some electroencephalography? Let's track our brain waves to make music. Um, lots of hands, things around our hands. We love those. Cello board. Um, there's the Carlax, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, Muse, the, the rock band Muse stuck a chaos pad into a bass guitar to um, augment the instrument. Um, another bodysuit with goggles. So you want to actually see the, the performer wants to actually see what um, visuals they may be controlling at the same time as sound production, whatever that one was. <laughs> um, how about a car engine? Now let's, let's, turn, let's turn a motor into an instrument, put, slap a keyboard on it. Um, okay, we got uh, different types of batons, more hands, um, slide trombones, uh, oh, gee, I've got to move my piano, my screen around. The disc clavier, of course, one of the older ones, actually a MIDI piano as a digital musical instrument. That's fair, I think, to call that a digital musical instrument. Um, of course, we're getting into wearables. Well, we've had wearables around for a long time, but how about things that we could wear, like the Ruffletron, um, more mallet cats, another tablets. Um, that was Amanda, by the way, mutant trumpet, 
I'm just going to keep going here. Med instrument. The body, yeah, med instrument's a good one. It's like an exoskeleton. Maybe that sits on your body. That's uh, me performing on the um, meta instrument, rulers, augmenting saxophones, got T sticks, sweat sticks, vibro wheels. Is that it? Oh my God. Drums, springs, etc. The sonic banana. There's the uh, box. And I think that's the last one I have for you, the sponge. If anyone ever wondered about um, what you could do with a sponge and music technology. Uh, Martin Merrier has just released a CD, actually a new CD of his sponge music. So that you might wanna check that out, Martin Merrier. So um, digital musical instruments, right? Uh, it's, it's kind of a wild, wild west out there of all sorts of uh, crazy things that people have done over the years. That's not up to date. Um, I, uh, there are many new, many new NIMES, new interfaces for musical expression being invented regularly. So um, before I get to the Carlax, I'm going to just end with a little bit of a um, discussion about challenges. Uh, in other words, um, you know, if you're going to be a digital musical instrumentalist or, or if you want to play gestural controllers, what are some of the challenges? Um, first one is sound, you guessed it. Um, the, uh, the digital in musical instruments normally don't come with any inherent sound properties. So that's for the inventor or the performer or the programmer, the music technician to actually think about and create literally the synthesis engine for a digital musical in instrument. Uh, gesture is another huge uh, important challenge. Um, how do you play a spring? How do you play a sponge? How do you play a stick? Um, what actually can you do with these things um, that would be visible and apparent to an audience member? Um, what if what if you're like me? You're coming from a classical music tradition, and you actually want to people. You want you actually want to encourage people to play these instruments. And so training is a huge challenge as well. Um, that maybe goes speaks to the idea of longevity. Uh, how can I um, the work that I do? Um, can I pass it on to the to the next generation? And then the last point, the last challenge I'm going to focus on um, is about space. And I've got a couple images here to try to reinforce what I'm saying, what I want to say here. On the left, um, rather, yeah, on the left, uh, that's you <laughs> playing the piano. I don't know. I'm going to assume that some of you um, remember the first time you ever played a musical instrument. So that's what I'm trying to get at on the left hand side. You know, this discovery, this wonderful discovery that in addition to my voice that I'm starting to learn how to speak and uh, express myself as a young child, I can touch things and these things explode. They make noises. They, they, you know, I can go low, I can go high on the piano and I'm getting these different noises and frequencies and how, how wonderful it is that I can do that. And then on the right-hand side is um, one, of, uh, one of our pioneers in the um, Nime community, um, Michel Weischwitz, playing his uh, creation, The Hands. Uh, Michel, um, well, he passed away uh, several years ago, but he was known for his instrument building, uh, also as a um, electronic music uh, performer. What I really appreciated in um, watching Michel was the way he um, worked with gesture on stage. So I've got a, a photo here that's a kind of typical stance, it's a typical posture that he would take on stage. And so um, the audience quickly realizes that um, there's something going on, right? If the musician on stage is uh, holding a gesture or always returning to a similar gesture, the audience can start to piece the puzzle together a little bit and start to understand that certain gestures may mean things. Now you add sound to it. And um, if it's done in a way where the gestures and the sounds start to exhibit some sort of logic, um, there, there can be a meaning there. There can, the, the, you can start to really craft a message, a musical message, I would say, ex an expressive message. So um, the challenge that I'm trying to point to is to get from um, you playing the piano to you, you, playing, you playing the hands. Um, it's not an, an evident path, but I think the, the, the I think the real uh, point here, the real secret here, is about remembering as a child how empowering it was to touch your instrument for the first time. Um, again, it, it was about 
the child learning that they inhabit space in a different way, right? It's not just their body and, and the things around their body, but it's the sounds they make. Because don't forget, they make sounds, people respond to those sounds. And it's through that dialogue, that communication that they understand, um, obviously as a child, probably not necessarily um, consciously, but that there is a, a relationship that they're building with the space around them. And Michel Zweischwitz in his, his way of performing and his posturing and gestures um, really conveyed that notion of capturing the, the space very well. And so um, through playing with digital musical instruments, one of the challenges is conveying to an audience that sort of um, uh, embodied uh, gesture that, that we try to strive for when we're playing musical instruments that are unrecognizable. Um, a piano um, in and of itself commands a space and people immediately in their mind can probably start to imagine what sort of sounds will emanate from that instrument. But if Michelle walks on with his hands or I walk on with a tea stick, there's no one in the audience that that's understanding what we're about to do. And so that's, that's a huge challenge, um, conveying that sense of space and the kind of expressiveness that we want to uh, convey in that space. Okay, so a little bit on the Carlax, and then I have um, uh, uh, just a few videos, and then hopefully uh, I'm not going to run out of time. So uh, let's get my notes here. The Carlax, uh, the, 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 the development for the Carlax began in 2001. Um, uh, the makers uh, Durry and Garabédien, they're based in France. They actually originated a company called Dafact, D-A, F-A-C-T as the um, um, manufacturing company of the Carl Axe. So the Carl Axe itself resembles, I'd say it resembles um, a clarinet or perhaps a soprano saxophone in size and geometry. Um, it's, uh, although its control structures have nothing to do with blowing, right? You don't blow in or through the Carl Axe like you would a clarinet or a saxophone. Instead, the Carl Axe um, transmits its data wire wirelessly so a computer's receiving some data, either um, OSC, OSC messages, open sound control, if that's something some of you may know about, open sound control, uh, or, or MIDI, in fact, musical instrument digital interface. It is designed also to transmit MIDI data wirelessly to your computer. Uh, the instrument itself has um, 10, 10 keys with a continuous range output. Uh, it has also eight velocity sensitive pistons. The keys I sometimes think of uh, like piano keys and the pistons like say the pistons of a, of a brass instrument, a trumpet, for instance. There's also 17 buttons and, um, uh, and a combination mini joystick and LCD character display. So the, the joystick manipulates the characters on, on a little LCD list, a little list of numbers and whatnot. Um, the interior of the instrument contains a three-axis gyroscope, also a three-axis accelerometer. So movements in space, orientations in space can be tracked and sent to your computer as MIDI data. And um, another, another nice clever feature, um, the upper half and the lower half of the instrument actually can rotate in opposite directions. It's like a, like a big potentiometer, like a rotary potentiometer. Um, in the photo on this slide, if you look on the left hand of side, the left and then the middle picture, if you can see that, the left and the right hands, um, they've actually twisted, they're twisted a bit. So they're, that's an example of the instrument um, uh, being turned, the upper and the lower half being turned in opposite directions. Again, like a big dial, um, which was quite, quite clever, I, I thought, I think. Um, uh, I, think I think that's all I'm going to say about the, the Carlax in terms of its... Um, construction and whatnot. So uh, I'm going to move into some sound and, and musical examples for you, short extracts. And uh, the, the examples I have for you, I'm, I'm just trying to illustrate some of the gestures that I've um, used for this instrument. Remember, as the um, instrument performer, I've had to design the sounds, I've had to design the gestures out of the box. Uh, like I said, it, it sends MIDI. But um, the, to send that MIDI data, it's some very basic um, uh, pushing of buttons. And uh, when it comes to gesture, I tend to think uh, about more complex gestures. So for instance, in this video, you'll see me using my fingers a lot. Um, 
Yeah, if you look closely, you'll probably see that I have finger combinations as well. So instead of just pressing, you know, one key down one at a time and making a certain sound, um, I, I programmed the instrument such that it would recognize multiple different key presses, much like if there's any brass players in the audience, much like we um, use pistons in a brass instrument to access different um, frequencies. And so uh, watch, watch for that. So this is all about fingering. Here we go. Okay, um, obviously a, a more of a kind of soft, uh, quieter moment um, shimmer is what I call the improvisation. Um, I, you would have noticed, I think, some of the combinations in terms of fingers. At the beginning too, there was a, a subtle frequency wash sound that occurred, and that was me also twisting the instrument. Um, the question I might ask as we get into some of these other examples is, from your perspective as audience, do the sounds and the gestures, do they make sense to you? Do they seem to correlate? Um, are they satisfying to look at and, and hear? Um, let's, let's, let's do another example here. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, one of my directions is to promote the use of technology with regular instruments. You can't really get more regular than a string quartet. That's one of the oldest classical music ensembles that we have. So I've got a little extract here from a piece that I did with the um, Penderecki String Quartet. They're based in Ontario, excellent fine musicians. I was extremely humbled to be on the stage with them. Of course, they had they played their instruments for decades. I had been playing the curl axe for three years. So about three or four years, so it was a bit nerve wracking. Um, so again, I'd ask you just to watch for some of the gestures that I make. I'm on the left-hand side there, should be on the left side of your video. Um, there's a bit of, there's a bit more motion. You'll see a bit more range of motion uh, with the Carlax this time. Um, there's a range of sounds that I'm also playing. So again, unlike perhaps a regular acoustic instrument, the digital musical instrumentalist might be asked to play multiple layers of sounds simultaneously. So let's, let's listen to this. Okay, um, you may notice too, um, this is a nice example of this constant sort of shaking. If you've noticed, uh, uh, like it may be a vibrato of some sort, um, I tend to use um, a lot of gestures that um, try to convey a roughness in timbre, a roughness in sound color, um, combined with um, a roughness in gesture, if you like. So the, the, agi the agi agitation or oscillation um, of, a, of a gesture might be conveyed in the sound itself as well. 
Um, let's keep going because I want to make sure to leave a little bit of time if anyone has questions. Um, another really a, a pleasure of playing these sorts of instruments, especially instruments that can be moved around in space, is that you might consider the theatrical component of your work. And again, thinking about the responsibility and the kind of um, conveyance of, of the general space that you, you inhabit as an mu instrumentalist, um, having an instrument that responds to wider, larger, broader gestures is quite empowering. Um, interesting way to kind of signal to the audience different layers of a, of a, of a sound creation or sound composition. Composition. This is um, my work, um, Ritual. This is actually in, um, in uh, Australia at a NIME event in 2016 at the uh, Queensland Conservatory Theatre. So again, um, a different, you'll see a different range of gestures and sounds. Um, let's, let's go. So uh, this, this example uh, opens the door to uh, percussive, percussive like sounds. And then the question is what sort of gesture um, might you use to really convey to the audience the notion of tapping bells or hitting bells, it's kind of percussive moments. And hopefully you noticed what was going on there. Um, I was using the gyroscope in particular. A gyroscope is really, really good for detecting even subtle changes in rotation. And I was able to do just some simple threshold detection. If the rotation is strong enough, I was able to trigger, trigger a sound like a percussive. Uh, I think it comes off as a kind of percussive attack and gesture. Um, I have one more, which I, I'll play it. It's kind of a fun project. Um, playing with other dig digital instrumentalists. Uh, this, in this case, um, we're in the hubs environment. Oh, there's such a long backstory to this. Um, in short, one of the projects that um, has taken off during COVID is performing remotely in 3D um, XR, augmented VR spaces, etc. cetera. Um, I've been doing a lot of work in Mozilla's hubs, which has been quite reliable and robust, especially for you know, a free open source VR uh, space. This was a concert at last year's nine. So technically um, the operation was in Shanghai. China, but uh, the three musicians, that was myself on Carlax. Um, in the middle is uh, Michal Seta playing a sopranino T-stick, the smallest of the T-sticks. And then Dirk Stromberg, who's based in Singapore, playing the phallophone. Um, and so a work that involved improvisation. Uh, you'll be able to see, I, I think, a, a few more gestures, um, but I'm more I'm just trying to convey, um, I, it's just a fun project to share with you all this talk about space and um, what are some of the solutions we may have in a COVID, a COVID year years.
Okay. Um, yeah, I should have mentioned, of course, uh, yeah, Dirk is in Singapore. Uh, Michal was in Montreal and I was uh, performing from home um, in Lethbridge. Uh, I do have another section a little bit on mapping, but I, I wondered if I should just put a pause to see if there's any questions. I know um, we have, of course, a, we, we have a time limit to this. I'm, I'm happy to, to um, proceed to any comments or questions, or um, maybe I, someone wants to signal. Do you want me to go on and talk a little bit about um, a mapping component to this? What do you think? Sure, I, I think <clears throat> um, if anyone does have a question, um, please feel free to throw that in the chat um, and we will open it up um, uh, to voice questions as well. Um, but if you wanna continue, uh, I, th I think we can, we can um, go over, uh, often if, if people have to go, that's okay, but we often do go over a little bit. So um, please feel free to continue. But yeah, if you do, if anyone has questions, go ahead and pop them into the chat now. Great. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, it's actually, I only have a couple slides left, <laughs> so it won't, it won't take long. Um, I was thinking about, um, I think it was a Tom who was asking perhaps about a little bit of Max, Max and like some of the, the software nuts and bolts behind um, this. And I, I'm, I'm not, yeah, I didn't, I don't have like a deep dive into Max for you this evening, but I do want to kind of give you um, a glimpse perhaps of how a Max patch could be organized for such a such a gestural controller. So before I show you um, um, that kind of schematic, I just wanted to, uh, if you haven't understood this yet, I wanted you to kind of think about what a what a gestural controller um, uh, consists of. And so um, when we talk about a gestural controller or a digital musical instrument, um, of course there is that hardware component, the things that perhaps um, you have in your hands. You have, as you know now know, um, a computer that's receiving data. Um, that data needs to be massaged, manipulated, transformed, and um, eventually uh, sent to some sort of synthesis engine, whether that's software or hardware, typically software these days. And then of course you need still um, a way to output that sound. And that would be you know, your audio interface to your loudspeakers. So you know, in the field, generally speaking, we conceptualize the digital musical instrument of having all these component parts. And so um, just like the piano, uh, these parts can be treated and built uh, separately. They're usually treated separately. There's no kind of one package that fits all. Um, so yeah, think if you were to think about dissecting the piano, that's essentially what I wanna talk about when we, when we look at um, mapping the data. We have to think about all of the component parts of the instrument, um, of this digital instrument from you know, um, the sensors um, to the um, output data that comes from it. So uh, it's, not a, it's not for the faint at heart, I'll tell you that. Um, I like working with teams, uh, with team members, <laughs> because it's, it's, a, it's a maze of programming. It really is. To get something useful and fruit, fruitful, it, it takes a lot of work. Um, there, of course, there's lots of discussion about the complexity of, of what I'm discussing. For instance, on the Carl Axe, I could have just used it out of the box and every finger I pressed down, every key I pressed, I could have you know, manipulated the sound just with a single press. But um, after a while, it, it's quite boring just to be able to, <laughs> to only just get one sound on a single, single press. So that's why I decided that there should be a combination of keys, a combination of touches that will get different sounds. And not only that, I didn't talk about this, but that the, um, uh, how should I say, the, um, the speed at which the keys are being pressed um, has an effect on the sound. You might think that sounds like MIDI velocity. It was more than that. Um, in my programming, I'm also measuring over time the, um, the rate of change in the keys. And that rate could be measured or mapped to some other sound parameters. But um, uh, just as a kind of glimpse um, bird's eye kind of view of what components you might be looking at in the programming domain. Uh, if I go from left to right, so the left um, kind of uh, light blue blah, blah, blob, I guess, is your instrument. And then the red block at the end is your sound uh, synthesis engine. So, you know, fundamentally there is that division between your, your instrument, your, your control surface, right? Your gestural controller. And then on the other hand, the system that's going to produce sound. If we stay with this with the left-hand side, what's what I want you to take away from here is, is the notion that 
there's going to be different levels of data acquisition. So you're going to get some raw information from your data, from your from your sensors. Um, um, as probably some of you know, accelerometers, for instance, are constantly spitting out data, seeing how accelerometers, they're sending their, their um, measurements based on, essentially based on gravity, right? And so as you're tilting and moving this thing, even slight little jarring of an accelerometer will um, have, it'll start generating and turn, churning out tons of data. That needs to be cooked, is what I call it. So cooking the data, that means um, taking some of that raw data that maybe is very um, moving very, very quickly and, and smoothing it, uh, like passing it, putting it through, through a filter, right? So that you're filtering out, filtering out some of the noise. So you're getting a kind of a smoother reading of that filter data. Cooking for me also usually means um, attaching a, a ID or tags, some kind of identifying a number to a particular sensor so that at later stages, I can actually identify that. Because the raw data, generally speaking, um, depends on the product, of course, and the manufacturer, but the raw data usually doesn't come with any recognizable identifier. It's just a channel of numbers that you have to kind of parse from a larger collection of numbers and maybe tag it with data. And then the very last phase, that's the bottom uh, left-hand corner of my graphic, it's what I call the instrument customized data. What I try there to do is within Max, look at some of the raw, look at some of that cooked data, combine it in such a way that the readings that come out of the instrument side are really representative of an instrumental, an instrumental gesture. And so when I say an instrumental gesture, I'm talking about um, you know, a, a gesture that would be recognized by the audience as a performance gesture on stage. So you know the tilting or the quick thrusting or moving of the carlax to produce a tone, that would be an instrumental gesture. That it's something that's very visible to the to the audience, and um, it's it's set. I've prepared it as instrument customized data, uh, ready to be tagged and to be sent to my sound engine as a per, as a potential sound exciter, for instance. Other examples are volume. Um, I often use my, my uh, tilt and um, orientation in space to, to map to just loudness controls. I think it's very clear to an audience um, when you're um, standing with a more kind of expansive posture that that would be a louder sound versus um, a posture that maybe you look like you're drawn in, you're bringing your instrument in closer to the body. Um, that, that would be a quieter sound. And again, that's all done within the in instrument customized data to kind of send out these sort of high level gesture information. Um, th there, as you see, there's also what I'm calling these hidden mappings or intermediary mapping layers. All that means is that within each of these layers, raw, cooked, um, instrument customized, there's a lot of additional mapping going on to combine um, different strands of data. So again, if I, if I choose a volume as my example, it's not just tilting the instrument. It's going to be... Um, um, tilt and probably a bit of rotation if I'm going to the left or the right. I mentioned that with the Carlax in particular, I'll do a kind of, um, uh, uh, I'll bring the instrument closer to my body to suggest a quieter sound. And when you do that, um, you can actually make use of that big potentiometer that I told you about, right? So I don't know if you, you can see probably what I'm doing here, but um, remember um, uh, the, the upper and the lower half of the instrument um, rotate, guess what? I can even, bring it to you show and tell style. Sorry, I should have had it in front of me, but here's the instrument, of course, the Carlax. And like I said, it, it wrote like the left, the left and the right hand rotates, right? So you can see I can actually rotate the, the upper and lower half. And when, you, when, you, when I bring the instrument into my um, body, um, you know, I could, bend, I could bend my wrists, I suppose, to get it in, inside. But I, I, I actually kind of like to leave my arms in a comfortable position and just rotate my whole arms out. It's it's much nicer than like than like twisting my wrist in. Um, long long <laughs> the long and short of this is that there are some gestures that you can really um, there are some sensors that you can really make use of uh, at, with specific types of gestures, and that's all done in this kind of intermediary mapping layer. I see I see a hand up from Jeff Jeff yeah. Jeffrey. Uh, uh, and I also, there's also um, a question by, uh, G hang on just a second, Jeff. There's also yep. a question in the chat by Jean-Anne 
um, which uh, is a really good one. It was one, one I was also going to ask, but it, it has to do, I think, with um, the sort of ten tension between some of the more uh, experimental instruments that are sometimes created and then there's sort of a one-off performance versus um, you know, creating a situation where the instrument and the piece um, that the instrument might be based on has a life. Um, and I'll, I'll say, before I let you answer it, I'll mm. say to oh. Nan, just a funny thing um, to know about, the, about Cage's cartridge music, which for those of you who don't know, was a piece of music based on phono cartridges. Um, uh, and I won't go into the details about how that worked, but I've held those cartridges in my hand because the funny thing about that is that though that piece was actually taken on tour by the Merce Cunningham Dance Company, and it was actually a major part of their repertory. And so um, that piece was actually performed a lot, even though um, uh, it might not have always been performed in a in a strictly musical sense uh, setting. Um, but it was actually part of the Cunningham Dance Company's repertory. So, um, so in that way, that actually did become um, a, a kind of a, a piece that had a life um, due to the fact that it was part of this. But yeah, I'll let, I'll let Andrew um, address uh, Jean Ann's larger question. Oh, to everyone, I'm trying to I'm just trying to say goodbye to Juan. <laughs> Thanks. I think I sent my message to Oliver. There you go. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, great point about that, um, Scott, and, and thanks for this, uh, this question. Um, have attitudes changed? I'd like to think they have. Um, the, I think the, you know, it's, it's not a new question, um, uh, you know, about the, the accessibility of certain musical tastes and flavors. And uh, we are working in, with a musical language that is already pretty abstract for the average listener. Um, so it's it's hard not to think just about that that general um, uh, general interest across the the the, the public. Um, it's a niche. I, th I think what we're doing is still pretty niche. Um, but um, my, my yeah, have attitude change. I think there's a lot of experimentation still out there. And to be honest, I, I think that's what makes the Nime community. A strong community is that um, um, they're they're embracing the novelties and the experiments still, and that's kind of what keeps them going. Um, I've run a couple workshops around these types of instruments, so I, I do try to spread the wealth a bit. And 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 like I said, working with acoustic instrumentalists, um, I I really try to encourage. I'm, I'm starting a project now for guitar, acoustic guitar. Um, um, uh, here for a wonderful guitarist in town. So guitarist and um, T-Stick, uh, Ileana Matos Vega. I'm really looking forward to working with her on this. Um, but, you know, until I can get that musician who spent, you know, 30 years on their instrument to consider picking up a Carillax, those attitudes are going to be hard to kind of break break down. The the I think the answer the other answer to this is to actually consider what we're doing as more than just a musical performance of course and look at what um, Scott's pointing at you know other art forms that this technology is clearly um, they're engaging with um, wow there's lots to say on this actually wearables um, but Jeff Jeffrey does Jeffrey have a question yeah and Jeffrey please feel free to um, unmute yourself and um, I think you can I think everyone is now able to turn their video on video on as well if they'd like oh, so cool. please Please go ahead and ask your question. Thanks. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so my question is kind of related to the previous question um, and also related to your uh, uh, your mapping and, and uh, you know, all of your programming um, diagram. You mentioned earlier in the uh, presentation, you're thinking about you know, how can you, you know, what, what are you creating? And, and as an instrumentalist, what are you passing on or what could you pass on to um, your contemporaries or to later generations? And it, it's sort of the thing that you're talking about in, uh, or what the previous uh, uh, question was about, you know, attitudes changing, but I sort of approaching it from a, you know, maybe a slightly more um, practical um, perspective, um, you know, how, all of, you know, all, like you said, this instrument, this uh, controller um, comes unattached. It's just, can, it's just giving data. So you have to decide on the data, um, what that's going to control. So there's a kind of, kind of a 
you know, a, a monster of in, infinite choice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and on top of that, in order to um, decide on that, you have to be fairly competent as a programmer to be able to do what you have in your diagram right here. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it, it, I guess there's kind of a, a parallel um, question here. Um, maybe the broader question is, um, and you partly answered it by saying, you know, the communities that you, uh, you know, that exist today for this are sort of niche communities, but, you know, how, how do you turn or who do you turn on to um, these instruments and try, try to pass this on um, or, or how do you do it? So that's sort of one, one track. The other track is um, in, in your performances that you show, are you, um, do you have sort of a central sonic instrument either through the mapping or through the sounds and the mapping that you sort of identify as your instrument? Because, you know, traditional instruments have such a sonic identity, even when they're played with experimental sounds that, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a real sonic identity to attach to that gesture, but with an instrument like the Carlax, uh, it, it can, it can control any sound. So the identity of the, of the instrument can change from piece to piece. So the parallel question is, do you have, do you have a central identity for that um, instrument and, um, or do, does it change from piece to piece? Yeah, and, and, and just thanks, Jeffrey. And, and what I was saying at near the beginning too, the notion that, the, that um, sound somehow has these kind of powers on us. And I would say then, I would argue then, so does the sound maker. So I think you're also getting at that as well as the, as the sound maker on the Carlax. What am, what am I doing to people with, with all this noise? Um, yeah, so I think the, um, if I go backwards through, through what you're saying there, um, I've had similar questions. Um, it's usually along the lines of, you know, what comes first? Is it, is it the sound or the gesture? Um, does it always sound the same? All these kinds of things and my answer has always been that um, the sounds vary they can vary widely from piece to piece or improvisation to improvisation or moment to moment um, but what i really try to maintain in every instrument that i use is the gesture vocabulary so um, that that that's what i strive for in terms of my main vehicle to you know communicate to an audience member um, after that, uh, you know, um, there's, there's, I usually talk about, I start talking about um, counteraction and concurrence. What I mean is that um, in playing these instruments, I try to think in terms of what gestures I make that really blend or shall we say concur, I should maybe put it the other way, what sounds concur with the specific type of movement. So the shaking, and there was one of the last video where I was actually doing what I like to call churning or swirling, which is just the one hand, like stirring in a coffee cup. And um, uh, I try to find sounds that concur with that, but I'm also open to counteraction, meaning I'm open to making sounds that, you know, the typical example is like the little tiny gesture, but a big explosive sound. And it just, it doesn't really make any sense to an onlooker. But I argue as the composer, improviser, creator, that that's part of my responsibility to communicate those counteractions, if you like, as part of the, as part of the project. So I have some nice mappings. I like some, I have some nice vocal mappings, right? Where everything I do is connected to a vocal sample. So it's just me sounding like, an, <laughs> sounding like another person through every gesture, every gesture that I do. But, you know, it, it, I, I, out of the box or when audience first start to see that, it, you know, it, they need to kind of figure out what the gesture language is about in terms of the words, because the sounds, the vocals, the sounds that I use are like spoken word, spoken phrases. So they're trying to, you know, equate the word sorry with a certain gesture. And so that, but that needs to be, again, uh, um, I would call that counteraction and that that needs to be um, embraced and performed for the audience then to kind of start to have meaning, take meaning behind behind it. Um, I hope that, does that kind of get to the second yeah, part of what you're saying? I, right? I think so. I mean, maybe the more direct question is, you know, how, um, you know, what, I guess I don't know how to say it. What's the uptake on how many people are 
interested in playing these type of instruments. Right. Yeah. So that kind of goes to the first part of your your um, your your sentence, your uh, questions. Um, and the word that came to my mind was collaboration. You were asking. I, th I think you were, yeah you were pointing at um, perhaps some of the hats multiple hats that a person has to wear, perhaps as a sound creator and a composer and a, you know, um, an organizer of sound ideas, but also a computer programmer, maybe a builder, someone who understands how sensors work and can, can track, ac acquire data. These are all multiple hats. And um, I, I mentioned earlier that my preference is always to work in a team uh, collaboratively. Um, some of my best experiences have been using other people's inventions. And I would say predominantly, that's how I function. I, I see myself as more of the practitioner. I like to tell, I like to think of myself as someone who can take the laboratory prototype and actually get it out into, into the public, get it out on stage and actually make, make use of it in ways maybe that the original inventor didn't think of. Mm. So that it's it's being open to collaboration. That's that's a big part of it. And you know, after that, I, I think it's through networking and collaboration that we will and we can kind of spread spread the wealth a bit, maybe, or spread the word. And and that's that's perhaps who I'm really targeting at the moment is, is you know, people that want to collaborate in these mixed media environments. Yeah, it's it's such an open ended question. I didn't think there was going to be a specific answer, but I, yeah, um, yeah I, I understand what you're saying. Are you an inventor yourself, or um, I'm a I'm a composer. Um, I um, I'm a performer. I perform on a. Um, I've been performing for about twenty years on a Chinese instrument, so I'm a part of Chinese tradition, um, and um, I use sensor controlled data to excel on ometers and potentiometers and stuff like that. So. Awesome. Yeah. yeah and he's a Mac, Max programmer too. Yeah, Max programmer. <laughs> Sometimes well, I wish I wasn't, but <laughs> everybody goes to you. You're the go-to. Yeah. <laughs> um, Scott mentioned um, commissioning. I, I've been able to actually commission composers to write uh, for write T stick music with for me. So okay. that's another. You know, I mentioned I've done workshops. So I've done mm -hmm. workshops for composers. I've done workshops for music technologists who want to perform and build um, my dream I guess would be maybe a performers workshop I should have a performers workshop uh, for Carlax um, they're not um, um, inexpensive instruments they're actually cost quite a bit and the developers uh, the fact are still keen and keen in supporting the development and building of them but they're a small group they, they can't build really one-offs so they have to kind of to make it financially feasible they kind of wait for orders and then build a bunch and that that doesn't happen very often so you know even just getting enough carl axe instruments out there um i've once been to an event where we had five all together that was magical <laughs> but to get them all in one room is is a hard one yeah uh, great thanks i appreciate yeah. it not a problem um, so Jean Ann has another question in the chat, and I'm just going to read it. If a certain piece is written for an instrument to be built, assembled by the performer, um, would this form a more collaborative relationship between composer and interpreter, rather than the latter held in stringently to, uh, so to speak, by the composer? Um, and I guess this speaks to, it, it actually this is sort of a continuation of what you're talking about in a way. Um, this difference between um, the sort of or, or the the tension between the performer composer relationship there. Yeah, I'm going to read it again too. If a certain piece is written for an instrument assembled by the performer, would this form a more collaborative relationship? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Rather than um, held to speak. You know, I, let me let me make a let me actually pose a follow up to that question, which is a question that I would pose to you as a colleague, and I and I thank you for reminding us that you're, uh, you're also um, a, a university professor at the University of Lep Lethbridge. I meant to mention that in, in the intro, but um, you and I as, as teachers um, in, in this realm, uh, this is a question having to do with um, the, the, the sort of the, the manner in which in music schools, we put a lot of emphasis on group performance mm -hmm. and ensembles and things like that. And so I'm wondering if maybe you could sort of take this topic and, and, and maybe give us some ideas that you might have around how one might 
create a space for students to both kind of put themselves in the in the um, in the role of the inventor um, as in terms of creating um, a new instrument and how that might um, work in an ensemble situation where there's a number of performers who are playing together um, and, uh, and, and giving the performers that kind of ensemble experience. I mean, it's never going to be exactly the same as an orchestra or something, but uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ton, tons of thoughts. Um, um, a lot of challenges there as well. Um, um, a lot, as you were, I think, alluding to, Scott, the um, traditions that we work in, in some conservatories or music schools, weigh heavily on us. Um, and finding, uh, first of all, a center, uh, Sound Studies Institute, willing to in explore and investigate is like the first step. Um, I, I can also mention, you know, my, my, um, some of my uh, graduate work was done at McGill University, and I was part of what was called back then the McGill Digital Orchestra. And that's very much a model that I think could be reproduced at other schools. So the model was essentially bringing uh, people with different expertise together. The Generally, the three expertise identified were um, performer, um, technician or technologist, maybe a better way to say that, and composer. And so um, uh, McGill is, you know, among our schools, of course, in Canada, McGill is kind of have steeped in the classical music tradition. Um, although they have, of course, a very vibrant music technology and sound recording area and all of this kind of stuff. So it's it's quite a, an unusual mix of people where you get um, really highly skilled uh, artists um, brushing elbows with people that are doing this kind of stuff, you know, sensor-based things. But, but you know, fundamentally, having, having a, a setting where you had willing participants that are interested in hearing how they express um, uh, their perspectives uh, with different language, um, different attitudes, um, the 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 technologists that I worked with, some of them had a pretty deep musical understanding. Um, some of them were clearly coming from you know maybe mathematics or scientific or science based background, and and I, I I was lost in their discussion of sensors and engineering, and uh, and but being with them and and having them. Uh, having people respond to uh, the challenges just of speaking about a topic was uh, really, really, really important. And of course, then acknowledging that everyone has um, specific expertise that can enhance the project, right? Um, so, uh, so finding the institute that kind of supports that framework, um, the interested participants that are are willing to take risks because it is a risk, right? Like. I, I was. Uh, I am a classically trained composer. Um, I, 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 I would say that my success as a composer has been relatively robust, but it hasn't been. Um, it, it perhaps has been diminished by the fact that I've put myself into a corner as a digital musical instrumentalist. Um, I don't. I don't regret that. Um, there are reasons why I chose my particular path. But it does, um, it does tend to, um, uh, for other people, kind of pr present limitations around what you could or you know, might be capable of doing. And so just finding uh, people that are willing to take that risk is, is a, big, a big step as well. Um, yeah, does that help? That's, these are kind of more kind of overviews. I mean, after that, I think it's about uh, finding projects that people really can um, relate to. And yeah. um, some of our colleagues in other institutions, for instance, build these kind of ensembles around other art forms. So maybe it's not solely music. Um, uh, I do a lot of live coding these days, thinking of um, David Ogborn at McMaster and a lot of his work. Again, it's, it's all about the laptop ensemble. There was days, there was a period in my life where I said, absolutely not. I'm not gonna sit in front of a laptop and just sit there on stage with laptops, right? That wasn't gonna be my thing. Um, and we have all the jokes about, you know, what are, doing, what are people doing behind laptops on stage? They don't, it's not a very dynamic stage performance. And as you can 
see that the dynamic stage presence is part of what I want to do, but but I've embraced it. I've understood a little bit more, you know, the pull of live coding. Or, or I think of UBC and I think of um, our work there uh, by Bob Pritchard. A lot of his um, ensemble work revolves around movement and dance and and um, wearable wearable technology. So that's probably a big part of it. Yeah. I, I agree. And I, I also think that in a way, the thing, one of the things you're talking about there is that this sort of the problem of the laptop, I think in a way, culture itself has kind of solved that problem for us because in the beginning of the laptop performer, that was often what the audience thought, right? But nowadays, we're pretty used to pe seeing people behind laptops, right? Um, and and not only not only just laptops all by themselves, but laptops with all sorts of things connected to them. Uh, and and so in a way, I think I think that the 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 sort of the larger culture is much more ready for uh, for accepting um, a lot of different modalities of performance, um, e even those that don't necessarily always have a real like clear um, ear to eye relationship. Um, but I think one of the things that's so interesting about your work is that you've really taken this idea of the gesture um, as a very serious part of what you're interested in mm -hmm. doing. Uh, and I, I really appreciate that about your work. Um, I think we have maybe time for one more um, quick question. Um, and I see Jeffrey's got his hand up, so we'll give him the last, the last word here. Yeah, I just uh, I have a question, but just to add what you guys were saying, I think um, my experience in teaching, um, uh, kind of this. Uh, Introduction, usually it's to non-music majors, um, not just at the institution I teach at now, but other institutions that, um, you know, with cell phones and, and um, all of the technology in there, you know, everybody is a tinkerer. So as soon as you turn them on to the bridge between the tinkering and the things that they can do with it, I think the, the natural intuitive imagination kicks in and creativity just, you know, explodes, just depending upon how much time they want to spend on it afterwards. The yeah. question I just wanted to ask was, in your compositions, um, how much, uh, you know, what's the, what's the um, dynamic between um, your, you know, your targeting and, and mapping of sounds and the amount of improvisation or experimentation that happens within what you've, what you've mapped or targeted? Yeah. Um... I think I understand what you're asking because uh, you you noticed uh, some of the videos I was I was literally reading a score right yeah so it's like literally mapped out what I need to do when I need to do it um, but then of course a great majority of what I do with all the instruments is is of course improv as well um, so um, you know as as when when I have my composer hat on um, it's all about reproducing. Um, it's all about being able to reproduce that performance um, uh, in subsequent performance. So like the Penderecki piece um, with the Penderecki Quartet, we have played it multiple times and um, uh, I try my best <laughs> to play these abstract sounds the same for the musicians each time it's hard because there is variability. I am mentioning like accelerometers, for example, you're never gonna get like the exact position every time. So I guess, I guess to respond, Jeffrey, then it's, it's about the mappings and how much fluidity or how much maybe flexibility I permit in the mappings um, uh, and randomness. And I guess, yeah, you probably noticed my, the, the title of my slide was um, uh, ex explicit, explicit mapping programming. So when I map, I, I, I try, I actually don't give a lot of, flexibility. I'm really, I try to be tough on myself. Like I need to do this gesture to get this precise sound with the precise bit of sound color and loudness. And it, it's not easy. And um, the question then becomes what type of synthesis, of course, you know, some synthesis is easier to control than others. And I tend to go with physical modeling synthesis, which is not easy to control. It can be quite temperamental. And so, um, you have to practice and maybe that's the bottom line to this right yeah. and the in the nine community uh, you know we talk about um we usually talk about we usually um, compare what we say low entry fee versus a ceiling on virtuosity it's kind of one of the expressions that's been passed around for years and the idea is that you know something that has very simple mapping and um you know relatively easy kind of understanding between gesture and sound production would be a low entry fee it wouldn't cost you much to actually fully understand how to play the instrument 
versus instruments that have have um, that don't have a ceiling on virtuosity, or that ceiling is like high, high and high. And that's kind of what I'm shooting for. I, I want people to play instruments and always kind of have, discovering new things about them. And it's, it's not that they're producing new sounds, it's that like any instrument, the more you become efficient on it, the more you feel you've got more control and power over it or power to express yourself. And so um, physical modeling can be temperamental, but I, I still struggle uh, to really maintain the same gesture and sound combination so that I, I really feel I'm playing something and not just the yeah. computer isn't taking over and right. making kind of rammed and noise. I, I think that I think that that makes sense and it makes a, a kind of a demarcation between kind of purely experimental um, right. performance versus actually playing an instrument, you know, playing something that you have uh, discipline and control yeah. over. Well, that's why I mentioned the class, like I, just to put it out there, because, you know, I, I come from that classical tradition and that's kind of what I'm shooting for, you know, that I can hopefully in generations to come that you know, uh, obviously the Carlax, the T-Sticks, the things that I play will, you know, disappear. But I'm hoping that, for instance, the idea of the gesture vocabulary as a centerpiece to gestural controllers will be something maybe that I can pass on to future generations that people will think about codifying the gestures they use as, as a basis for playing these things. Mm -hmm. um, Great, yeah. thanks. Hey. Well, thank you for that. And I maybe the last thing I'll say um, before I give my final thanks to Andrew is um, he's right. Sound Studies Institute um, being very interested in all things sound. It is true that I do have a particular interest in in uh, new new musical instruments and the develop of, development of musical instruments. And you may have noticed <laughs> that we kind of have a little mini series going here this year on the lecture series. Um, some of you attended the talk last week by Courtney Brown, who's a research creationist composer working on dinosaur skulls and making those into musical instruments. And we have Andrew tonight talking about his, uh, his work. And um, our talk in the next, uh, the next uh, talk in two weeks, uh, which I hope some of you can come to, uh, Jesse Acorn uh, is gonna be talking to us about the history of electromechanical keyboard instruments, uh, which actually has um, uh, a very rich history and is connected very, very much to all of this work um, that, we've been, that we've been looking at. Um, so, uh, hopefully some of you can come uh, to that and I, um, but I do want to just thank um, uh, Andrew for this fantastic talk this evening and thank you all for coming and I also want to thank um, Tom Merklinger, um, Oliver Rossier and Gail Mendrick as usual, um, who are uh, behind the scenes and helping us uh, keep this keep this ship afloat. <laughs> And uh, as is our tradition, um, you can all uh, unmute yourselves and uh, turn on your video. And let's give Andrew a very warm Zoom noisy uh, round of applause and or whatever other noise making. <laughs> Thank you all so much. And uh, I hope everyone has a, a terrific evening. Stay warm. Uh, I think it's getting colder, right? I don't know. It's supposed to be. <laughs> all right. And we'll talk to you. Hopefully see you all in a couple of weeks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much.